Welcome, Jeff, Ken, Kelly, everybody. I'm really excited for this Q&A Monday. We're going to be talking about construction. And we have a lot of great, I have a lot of great things to share with you, a lot of knowledge to share with you. So brief, brief overview of my background. So um, I actually got started as a project engineer for a construction company right after I finished with school in 2015, which was like five minutes ago feels like. Um, <laughs> and so with that company, I was in a rotational program and I traveled all around the country building all types of stuff. I built uh, conveyor systems on mines. So I worked at copper mines, several copper mines. Um, I worked at the Dakota Access Pipeline, actually flew drones up there, as well as helped build six terminals. I've worked at ref oil refineries. And so I've worked, I've built a lot of industrial grade things. Um, and then I also interned for other companies and, and like Sunoco, who's a oil and gas company. And I helped, I worked in their construction division building butane blending systems. So I have construction is what I, what I've come from. Um, and I went to school for mining engineering. So I know a lot about mining too. So maybe I'll do a Q and a about mining. Um, it's, it's a different beast. I'll tell y'all, but anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Great to see everybody here. Kelly, you can hear me and see me. Anthony says he can hear me and see me. Ken says I'm looking good. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. David says hi. Jeff says I hear ya. And Ryan says hi. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. And welcome to Q&A Monday. So excited for this one. So let's get started here. Uh-oh. Oh, here we go. Danielle, hi. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, so let's get started with our very first question. Hello, Bobby. Let's get started with this first question. Can a pilot without construction experience cross over industry? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, which leads us into the second part of that question. What actions can they take to establish credibility? And it's something that I talked about a little bit earlier today, but you can go out and learn as much as you can about the industry you're trying to go into, whether it's construction or something else. Go out there and learn everything that you can about that industry. Take a free online course. Go out and ask a construction company if you can be an intern for a week, a day, an afternoon, an hour, a minute. Get that hands-on experience. And read everything you can. There's YouTube videos about construction out there. There's lots of things about construction out there. It's, a, it's an older industry and a lot hasn't really changed. So I'm going to tell you a lot about construction during this Q&A. So you're going to get a big kind of a high level overview of the construction industry. And then I'm going to tell you ability more, but to answer, to establish your credibility there and seek as much information as you can. And then you want to be able to put that on display. And I don't mean on display, like, you know, wave a flag around and be like, look at me, I know about you. I to your potential clients and it's through, you can do that and things like that. It attends construction conferences as a drone pilot or construction meetups, people will see you over and over and over again. And they'll say like, Hey, she knows what she's talking about. She keeps coming to all these sessions. I'm sure she's learning something or he depending, you know, depending on, on uh, what you are. But anyway, let's make sure there's no questions about that. Gosh, there's a lot of people on tonight. This is great. Y'all I'm, I'm really excited anyway. So let's do a quick quick, quick, quick crash course on construction. So construction on a project, everybody's number one priority is safety. And it's their priority, their priority, if number one, obviously you'll want the same amount of pe people to go home in the same condition as they came in in the morning, ethical reasons. The second is that it's very expensive when people get hurt, not just from paying for their injury standpoint, but their worker comp, the worker's comp insurance can go up and you could have lawsuits, all kinds of stuff. When people are out of work for lost time, um, you know, you have to pay their wages depending on what the issue is. And the third thing, it's actually a business decision. So in the construction world, if your TRIR, AKA known as your total recordable 
incident rate, T R I R, is above a certain number, you cannot bid on projects. So if you as a drone pilot have a TRIR that is too high, total recordable incident rate, construction's number one priority is safety. And we were, I was talking about TRIR, I believe, where I left off, correct? Yes, yes, okay. So your TRIR better be zero. And the reason why it has to be zero is because companies cannot bid on projects if their safety numbers are not in compliant with what the company is looking for. For example, my company, we wouldn't even talk to anybody who had a TRIR above a one. So I forgot exactly what that metric measures. But if your TRIR was above a one, we wouldn't even consider your bid. So just keep that in mind. Um, that your TRIR better be a one, I mean, better be a zero, excuse me, your TIR, a TRIR better be zero. Okay. So the next thing about construction is I'm going to TRIR, sorry, Ken, he wants me to restate what the acronym is. So TIR, T, wow, <laughs> TRIR. IR is total recordable incident rate, and it's a metric that you have to measure by OSHA. There's other metrics too, but that's the easiest one for us to figure out and for us to know. Perfect. Just like Lindsay said, total recordable incident rate. And so I would, I would implore all of you, if you're serious about getting into construction, I suggest that you take your OSHA 10, O-S-H-A 10 course, because that is going to give you a great introduction to what safety you need to look at for a site. It's a 10 hour course. It's online. I don't remember how much it is. I think it's like $75 maybe, but there's also a requirement in certain areas, certain construction sites, certain cities, certain counties, certain states that require you to have in OSHA 10 before you can even step on their job site. So it just depends on your location. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the construction process a little bit while we're here. So there's, there's three basic phases to a construction project. There's a pre-bid pre slash bid. There's the actual job. That's where you're actually building things. And then there's the mechanical completion. And so we as drone pilots can help in all three phases of a construction project. Okay, the pre-bid and the bid is when companies and other contractors and things are gathering information so they can put in their best estimate. So they're gathering information for their estimators, giving it to their estimators, and then trying to um, make the absolute best bid that they can based on their estimates. And the more information that they have, the better estimate they'll be able to give. So obviously from our standpoint, we can create a 3D map for them during that pre-bid process. And we're a lot cheaper than a surveyor. Surveyors, actual surveyors that go out with the total station and all of that stuff, they're very, very expensive. And it takes a long time too. I actually took a I had to take a surveying class in college and I hated it. So, cause it just took so long and it was really cold and we would be out in the middle of the quad. So like students would be walking around this, but anyway, anyway. Um, so the more information that an estimator has, the better estimation that they can potentially make, especially if it's a place where the site isn't particularly flat or if it's a place where the soils can be difficult or a place that isn't, cut and paste. Every construction project is different. Every construction project has its challenges. So it really depends on the project. Okay. So we have a question from Kelly. Are drone surveys accurate enough to be used for pre-bidding? They're good enough. Are they survey grade? No. Are they good enough to be used for engineering drawings? No but they're good enough to get a rough estimate of a survey. What companies do now is they just go with what they are given. So sometimes they'll be given documents. Sometimes they're not given documents. It depends on the type of bid and how the pre-bid process is going to go. But um, sometimes the surveys are very old. Sometimes the surveys are new. Sometimes the company that you are contracting from expects you to pay for your own survey, which a lot of companies won't do because you haven't been awarded the project and you may not be paid back for 
having the survey. So are drone surveys accurate enough to be used for pre-bidding? I think there's certainly a value. They're not survey grade unless you have real equipment and you're a real licensed surveyor, um, but they're good enough. All right. So this brings us, oh wait, I didn't finish going through the three phases. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay. Um, the next phase is, is obviously building the job. Keeping track of where things are is very, very important. So throughout a job, somebody like myself, a project engineer or someone else, a quantity tracker has to let everybody else know as well as the client or owner know where they are in the phase of construction. And you do that through quantity measurements, measuring quantities. So you look at drawings, you cross through things that are complete, you throw it in a spreadsheet and you say we're X percent complete. And you can verify that with pictures, with videos, but you can also verify that again with 3D maps. And that's one thing I really loved using personally as a project engineer when I was verifying quantities was having a 3D map. And I could just go around and pick up everything that I might have missed walking out there and looking at it. And a lot of times, every, every company has a different process for doing this. The way it's supposed to work, textbook way, is the field engineer, the project engineer goes out. They make their quantities. They keep the quantities closed. Then they turn it over to the project manager. They take a look at it. Then they turn it over to the client. I know I've worked on projects where it hasn't been like that. Sometimes there's so much going on that I just take the superintendent's word for it. For their particular craft. Um, so like if the mechanical superintendent comes up to me and says, hey, he built these 10 drawings were 50% complete. Sometimes I would just have to take his or her word for it, um, depending on how much of a rush I'm in. But it would have been a lot faster to fly my drone around, create a 3D map and be able to actually verify it. So and then there's mechanical completion. Upon mechanical completion of a job, you have to turn over a lot of documents. You have to show proof that it's mechanically complete, that you completed everything in the contract that's laid out in the contract. And obviously drones can help verify that as well. And on a construction job, there's two sides to it. There's an owner and there's the contractor. And there's people typically underneath of a contractor too. So there might be a construction management firm and then prime contractors and then subcontractors and, and sub subcontractors and lots of people underneath of it. I don't want you to just concentrate on approaching construction companies. I also want you owners because when we were using drones in North Dakota at the company I previously worked for, when I was working at the Dakota Access Pipeline, the owner loved the pictures. They loved being able to verify what their contractor was telling them and what their inspectors and what the construction management firm was telling I know I just threw out a bunch of things. There's a lot of people who are involved within a construction project and not every construction company is a construction company. And actually, I'm going to get into that more later. But let's go ahead and talk about options are construction companies looking for. And construction companies are looking for anything that's going in, save the money and reduce their risk. Okay. Save the money, save them time or reduce their management. Risk mitigation is huge. Risk industries like in oil and gas, same in mining, reducing risk. Obviously every business wants to reduce risk, but the risks are a little higher in other industries. So the less foot traffic you have on your site, the more reduced your risk is. And so a big thing, and I'll use North Dakota as an example again, a big thing that people loved about us using drones on that project was that they didn't have to come to North Dakota to look. If they wanted to know what was going on. They would just simply ask us to send us pictures or they would go on to a progress site that I set up for them to view pictures as I uploaded them once a week. So reducing risk is huge. And so when you approach a company, don't just say, hey, I can take pretty pictures for you and I can put them on a site. Take it a step for take it a step further. So what you take pictures and you can put them on a site. I can help you reduce your risk by X percent by not having additional foot traffic on your site, because if somebody walks walks onto their site and they stub their toe, which they shouldn't because they should be wearing steel toed boots that could be a big problem. Okay, so we got a question from the audience from Tony. 
what platform do you suggest we use for 3D maps, drone deploy or Pix4D? You know, Tony, I think it really comes down to personal preference and what you can afford. Um, personally, I think Pix4D is more accurate and it's more intuitive for me as an engineer because it's closer to AutoCAD, which is what I learned in school. But I think Drone Deploy probably has a better user interface for those who haven't been that type of engineering software. So I would say it's really personal preference on that one. Um, like I said, which one you can afford and which one you prefer. Also, Pix4D requires a lot of computing power. So you can't use it on, you know, four gigabytes of RAM with a hundred gigabyte hard drive. You have to have some serious computer power to use Pix4D, drone deploy the maps are processed on a cloud. Another thing to think about with that is if the company you're working for has concerns about privacy, they may not want their information being put up on the cloud like how drone deploy does and would prefer for it to be on a hard machine like Pix4D. So I hope that answers your question, Tony. And Ryan says, why wouldn't people come to North Dakota? <laughs> There's a reason why I'm not there anymore, Ryan. Okay. So what type of, what solutions are construction companies looking for? They're looking for anything that reduces their risk. And we talked about that kind of with the photos a little bit, lowering foot traffic on their sites. Um, also, <laughs> also, um, they're looking for things that save them time and save them money. A big, a big spender, a big spending item in construction are change orders. So change orders are anything that is outside of the scope of the contract that's written. So say um, I'm building a pipeline for Exxon Mobil and they say like, you know, Taylor, we wanted you to build 10 feet of pipeline, but instead, can you build 50 feet of pipeline? So then I would put in a change order. Sometimes change orders come about um, not through a change the client proposes. Sometimes things just happen. Sometimes the soils you run into are just terrible, like what happened with us in North Dakota. You know, we had a certain amount, they, they, we had a certain amount budgeted for the soils. Turns out the soils were trash. So we had to bring in a whole bunch of dirt for cut and fills. And then we put in a change order to the client. Um, not saying that drones could have helped avoided that, but that's just an example of a change order. So verifying things and verifying change orders are a big ones. So kind of the themes I've been talking about are verifying things, verifying quantities is huge. If you have the wrong quantities in your spreadsheet, if you're claiming more or less than what you're actually earning on a project to a client, that can hurt their relationship, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And, and they're also looking for things to help them save time. And so Ken said, uh, Ken said that you could do cut and fill volumetrics. Absolutely, you could do cut and fill volumetrics. But on a site, before you dig anything is when, um, before you dig, you couldn't do cut and fill volumetrics. There has to be some sort of volume change there. Um, so anyway, so anything that saves them time, saves them money, reduces their risk are things that construction companies are definitely interested in, definitely interested in. Okay, so let's let's talk about the type of construction companies out there. And I really should say the types of companies that are involved in construction. And this is just something you might hear as you're further into the to the uh into the construction industry. And David asked, did the connection just drop? I hope not. I really, really hope not. Is everybody still connected to the q and It says it's live for me, so I just wanna verify that everybody's still connected. Oh boy, I think the connection might've dropped. No, okay, John says I'm good, whew. All right. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm sweating over here over this technology. I don't, I, I really, <laughs> I really want to get through this. So I'm, I'm starting to get nervous. I'm sweating. So I apologize. I actually, I don't apologize for sweating because it, you know, it's also a little hot. But uh, okay. Anyway, so the types of construction companies, this acronym EPFC Engineering, Procurement, Fabrication construction. So there are some companies out there that are EPFC firms. They do the engineering, they can do procurement, they can do the fabrication, and they can do the construction, which means that they're designing the project, 
They're procuring all the materials for the project. They're fabricating anything that needs to be fabricated for the project. And they're constructing it. So there's companies that come in all different shapes and sizes within EPFC. Some companies are just engineering firms. Some companies just get the contract to do the procurement part. Some companies only do fabrication. And then some companies only do construction. So when you have a big project, like a, you know, more than we're talking multi-million dollar projects, especially when you get into like the 50 plus million project mark, you know, you start to see EPC firms or EPFC and you start seeing more of that terminology. But I just know what part of the process you're dealing with. Are you talking to the EPFC firm? Because there can be an opportunity also for you to share your work with multiple companies and multiple contractors on one site. There's an opportunity for you to share the same photo with multiple contractors, which obviously is a way higher margin for you as a business person, as a drone pilot. You know, you take one picture, you share it with the owner, you share it with the main contractor, the construction management firm, and you share it with a few primes below. And you can charge each person for that one picture or set of pictures or whatever it is. So EPFC, engineering, procurement, fabrication, construction. And there's things that drones do in every single part of that process. I'll go through it really quickly just so we can keep everything moving and I can answer all of your questions. So engineering, obviously there's an opportunity with mapping there. You can overlay a map that you make with ground control points onto an AutoCAD drawing and they can compare their designs and see if things are placed in the right areas and make sure it makes sense. A lot of times, um, a lot of times with uh, engineering firms, the engineer stays inside of a, a room with a computer. And so sometimes the designs just don't work because they're not out on the site and the information that they have isn't necessarily accurate. Um, procurement, obviously you wanna know how much of what you have on a site and you could certainly keep track of that with the drone. I talked about that in the business plan uh, tutorial I put out last week. Fabrication, you can give, you can give the uh, pictures, maps, videos to a fabricator and they can fabricate to that alongside with the engineering drawings. And then of course, construction, we already talked about that. And so we have some questions from Tony. Have you ever utilized the Kespri 2.0 drone? No, but it does look cool, but they are very expensive. <laughs> I will say they are very expensive, but I have not used one myself. Um, okay. And Another question from Kelly, do those companies not share pictures amongst each other? No, typically the companies are not, well, you know what, I, I won't say, I won't make a generalization, but I've been on sites where the companies are not friendly with each other at all. I've been on sites where they are friendly with each other. So it depends. A lot of times information is hard to share because if you claim something, you have to take ownership of the thing that you claim. So from a legal standpoint, I know a lot of people don't like to share with each other from person to person. So it really depends on the dynamics of the site. So I would say most times, Kelly, no, they do not share pictures amongst each other. Um, and like Lindsay said, they're using, they're buying a license for the specific use sharing. It's kind of like burning copy CD for a friend. Yeah, and plus they don't like sharing, so. Um, Okay, let's go to the next question on our agenda. What is the best way to approach a company about work? And I'm assuming this means about work as a drone pilot. So the best way to approach a company, specifically a construction company, is to approach them with solutions. Go up to them with solutions. And this is how I would do it. This is how I do a pitch. If I'm meeting Mrs. Smith, owner of XYZ Construction Company, I would go up to Mr. Mrs. Smith and say, hey, how you doing, Mrs. Smith? I'm Taylor Mitchum. What do you do, Mrs. Smith? Oh, I own a construction company. Oh, that's so cool. What projects do you have going on right now? Oh, you know, we're building that pipeline up in uh, North Dakota and it's going to go to Illinois. And nah, 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 nah. I was like, really? Like, what are the challenges you're experiencing with that project right now, Mrs. Smith? Oh, well, keeping track of everything's gonna be really hard because it's such a big pipeline and it's so many miles long and all that good stuff. You know, it's just gonna be really hard to keep track of everything. But Mrs. Smith, what if I told you that Sky Ninja can help you keep track of that stuff for less than you think? And I want you all to understand. So out of this scenario for a second, I want you all to understand the only alternative to tracking this stuff 
from the air with photos is a plane. And when I was in North Dakota, and this wasn't that long ago, this was in uh, December of 2016 and uh, 15, excuse me, December 2015. Um, I was there and we got a cost estimate for a plane and it was over $3,000 just for one picture, $3,000 for one picture, one flight, one picture. That's crazy, y'all. One picture, $3,000. I'm sure they would have done two for $3,000 too. But once we heard that, we knew that that was kind of out of our price range. And that's when we explored drones more closely. And thank God, because I wouldn't have gotten into drones if that weren't the case. And that was two, December 2015. I know. But anyway, let's get back to Mrs. Smith. I see y'all kind of like my voice for Mrs. Smith. I'm glad. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so we're having a lot of problems um, tracking our projects, and we're just really worried about keeping everything on track because we have to have oil coming through the pipeline by January, and uh, we just really need help keeping track of everything and all of our, our contractors. And I'll say, Mrs. Smith, you know, we can help you progress uh, the sites and help you keep track of everything. We can fly our drones once a week. We can take 10 photos of each area that we designate. Oh, the camera's funky. Okay. We can take 10 photos of each area that you designate. We can take 10 photos of each site, north, south, east, west. And if you want, once a month, we can come out and do a map so you can do a virtual walkthrough of the site. How does that sound, Mr. Smith? Well, I mean, I don't know. How much is this going to cost me? Mr. Smith, I'd love to write you up a proposal. How about I meet with you tomorrow at your office? And we go over in detail what's going on. I'm more than happy to sign an NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement, which you may have to sign with certain companies, y'all. So just be prepared for that, especially if there's proprietary information happening. If there's proprietary stuff going on in the project. You'll, you might have to sign an NDA. And so, you know, I'll go and I'll meet with Mrs. Smith and I'll make her a proposal and she'll say yay or nay. But that's basically how I would approach her. I would find out what she has going on at her company, what problems she foresees or problems that she's having, and, and I propose a solution. And that's my basic, uh, that's my basic formula for, for how I do stuff. Okay. And who should I ask for? I'm assuming when you approach a company, who should you ask for? This one's tricky because Every company has a different decision maker. Every company, every position has a different purchasing limit on their credit card. Every company handles procurements and supply chain differently. So when you're approaching, if you're at a networking event, talk to who's there. Talk to who's there. Because more likely than not at a networking event, at a conference, it's the people who can make decisions who are at those things. Because those people have the mindset when they're in those places of doing business. They're looking for goods and services as well as trying to put out their goods and services that they have. So I would just, if you're going to go cold call, I hate cold calling companies. I actually wouldn't suggest that you get on the phone and cold call and unless you have a lead of some sort, or you met somebody from that company or so or something like that because the company I used to work for it was almost a two billion dollar company and trying to figure out somebody who could make a decision about drones would be very tough but if you have the time the energy talk to everybody win over everybody because you never know who influences somebody else I've made sales from somebody who was I, I was talking to an intern I didn't even realize they were an intern I was talking to an intern about what I did and um they were like, well, I'm going to talk to my boss about this. And I was like, all right, cool. I didn't think anything of it. I never thought anything would come from it. The next day, his boss called me and said, when can you start? When can you come down here and do this stuff? My intern, Henry, told me about what you were doing. It's awesome. So you never know. You never know when when you're going to hit the right person, talk to the right person, and and get to the person who can sign a purchase order. Okay. Let's go over here to the questions. John McBride, familiar with Bentley software, their market share in construction is very large, like DJI drones. Would it be who of the uh, analytics from a drone rather than using PIX4D that no typical construction company uses? Familiar with Bentley? No, but I think it does make sense for a construction company to keep analytics. And I know that. You know, the construction company as a whole, they're kind of dinosaurs. 
So I was tracking a $400 million construct, $400 million in Excel. So a lot of construction, and we were at almost a $2 billion companies. So a lot of construction companies. So yes, I think it would be great for them to track analytics from a drone, but I don't think they're there yet. Um, I hope that answers your question, John. If that didn't, please post in the comments below. And I will make third. Let's go to Lindsay's question. Do you have to try to convince a company that has said no to you? Oh, okay, wait. Okay, have you tried to convince a company that has said no to your proposal? Um, I I would have to. I, yeah, I I have to say I have. I have. I haven't won. I haven't won that fight. Um, typically, you know, my first offer is my best offer. I don't like going back and forth with people. Um, and they're just how the bidding process works, especially with publicly traded companies is you give them one prize, they come back to you and they say, okay, give us your best and final. And it's just all this. I don't like going back and forth. Like, this is what it is. This is what I'm willing to do it for. Unless there's something specific that they want me to cut in or out of the proposal that I gave them, I typically don't try and go back and forth. So I'm, I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't like going back and forth. Okay, next. Put together business packets. Does that work for anyone? So David asks, do you put together business packets? Does that work for anyone? I'm going to be honest with you, David. I do not use business packets. I, I like I like to talk and I like to pull out my phone examples of what I've done. Um, if I'm doing like I don't I started out going to offices and leaving packets, but it got turned on my on my printing investment that I made. So I stopped doing that. Um, so I'm sure other people have had success with business packets, but I don't do that. I prefer to talk and show them on my phone or with the PowerPoint. Um, and if they want a card, I'm, I'm more than happy to give them a card as well. He hates cold calls. They really suck. They really do. And Ken says he likes cold calls. Good for you, Ken. I think it's, uh, you know, somebody out there has to like doing cold calls. I like cold networking. I like meeting new people, but I don't like physically calling on the phone. So, okay. And uh, asked okay were you trying to offer a complete tracking solution with software and services or just providing data to one of their architects so what i was offering was data to the project engineers is typically who i talk to a lot of times and it depends like i said how involved the company fc process i don't always talk to the architects a lot of architects to be honest most so the probably industrial side, they don't really have um, I've gotten more into kind of residential educational projects more recently where there are architects, but typically I'm talking to the construction management firm when I get approached about doing a job. If that answers your question, Ken. Okay, Kelly asks, do you charge a flat rate? for your weekly 10 progress picks, or do you change the price depending on the total size and revenue of the project? I charge a flat rate depending on how long I think it's going. So every project is not charged the same, but I wouldn't look at the dollar value of the project itself to decide how much I'm going to spend on progress picks. Picks And the reason is that is that as companies put this type of services in their estimates and in their budget, every every project has a marketing budget in it and they have a line item in their budget. It's not going to be proportionate to how much the project is worth. So and, and in construction companies, just point of information, the margins are not very high after, I mean, you're looking at profits anywhere from 10 to 30% in construction. And so it depends on how much overhead the company has, but the profit margin is very, very low in construction compared to other industries, especially compared to what we do. So there's not necessarily a lot of room there for overcharging for things. So I typically just charge a flat rate because that's easiest for everybody to understand. This is what it's going to cost. That's it the end, bada bing, bada boom. And after you do it the first time, you have the flight plan program to whatever app that you use, it gets cheaper. So that's that's what I use. 
Okay, John said, yes, thanks for the answer. I like Pix4D, but it doesn't always seem congruent with current construction software. I totally agree with you, John. It's not perfect. And I think that there's an opportunity for somebody to come in and create something better. I really do. Um, <laughs> Kelly says, let's hire Ken to do our cold calls. I agree, Kelly. We should. We should. Um, Tony asks, most companies want to know if you have any past performance procurements, any references they could talk to about your performance. Yes. Sometimes when you're submitting a bid, they specifically ask for references. And here is how you get references. Tony, go out and get some results for people, even if you're doing it for free. And I'm not saying a lot of people, if you do two, two, three, four, five jobs for free, you get excellent references. You can use those people for life and leverage them for beyond from now until beyond. And that's what I did. Even though I came from the construction industry, I still had to get references as my own. I had to get references for my business Sky Ninja. I had to get references for Taylor Mitch from the drone pilot. So don't be afraid to go out there, talk to people and say, hey, look, I have a I have a drone. I have this solution that I think could really help you. I'm getting started right off the ground. I'd love to do this for you for free and exchange a good job. You just gave me a great testimony reference. How does that sound? something very simple like that. Most people won't say no unless there's something else going on there or they have proprietary issues or there's some sort of risk that they're not willing to take with letting you on their site. But don't be afraid to go out there and do some jobs for free. I think we've all done it. I've certainly done it and I'm not ashamed to say that. Okay. Problems with any scope creep. I'm guessing you're saying, are there any problems with people coming up to me and saying, can you do this and take pictures of that and actually fly over here? I would say no, because I set that expectation up front and I get it in writing. So when I go up to somebody and say, I do my 10, my 10 picture package, I go up to them and I say, okay, north, south, east, west, and then six landmarks on the site. That's my typical package. And depending if the site's bigger, I'll, I'll up the picture amount and I might charge a little more. But then we write down the north, south, east, west. And then we put in writing what the six other landmarks are, seven other landmarks or however, any, however many more points. I write those down. I get them in writing because, yes, there are people who will come up to you, people who don't know what you're doing, they'll come up to you and say like, oh, can you go over here and look at this thing? And da, 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 da. And I'm just like, you know, I, I I have to do these things. I'm contractually, if you say you're contractually obligated to look at these 10 things and these 10 things only, nobody's going to get mad at you and say, talk to so-and-so or talk to you. Let's, and, and if somebody's really adamant about getting pictures of a certain thing or they want to add more things to what you're doing, Take that person and take your point of contact, whoever, whoever's paying you, take that person requesting it, take your point of contact on site and who's ever paying you and just have a conversation about it. A lot of times, if it's just one more thing, I'll do it. But if they're talking about five, 10, 15 things, um, I'll just go back to them and say like, Hey, he wants pictures of this. That's fine. I'm going to charge you X amount. And usually they'll say, yeah, you're nay. And that's it. And doesn't affect the relationship at all. So. Yes, I do have all, I like to keep everything in writing. That's why there's, that way there's no disputes, no disputes whatsoever. Okay. Uh, let's go to, oh, we have more questions. Okay. Tyler asked, does this count as our daily industry read? No. <laughs> this does not count as your daily industry read, Tyler. So this morning I put a challenge in the group that says, I want everybody to read five minutes every single day about the industry they're serving, at least five minutes, because I still do it. I read about construction every single day. And I want to challenge y'all to do that too, but we'll talk about that more at the end. And no, Tyler, this does not count as your five minute read for today. Okay. We got a comment from John. So many want to not use GCPs. It's a common question I receive. In your experience, would this ever go away? Use of ground control points is right? Ground control points, I'm assuming is what you're talking about. I use ground control points. I think that I don't see why you wouldn't use them. Um, just from what I know about surveying, what I learned in class, it just makes everything so much easier. And even when you're just using the software, it makes everything really easy to match everything together to make sure you have the correct amount of points. Just from my my personal 
uh, experience, but you don't have to use GCPs if you're not trying to get super accurate. If you're okay with being sent several tens of twenties of meters, if you're if you're okay with being within meters of accuracy, that's fine. If you want more accuracy, use ground control points. I just like using ground control points because it just helps me match everything up better when I'm using the software. Okay, Desiree asks, do you offer video also? Yes, and that is a different package and that is an upgrade to my 10 picture package. So yes, I do offer video. Actually, last week I was at Penn State and I did video for them and I charged them. Typically for video, I'll do a half day or full day rate. I'll say like if I'm here for half the day doing these videos, it's X amount, full day is this amount, just to keep things as simple as possible. Okay. The catalyst says, when you get paid, do you ask for deposits? That's a really good question. So I get paid by the terms of the other company. I put all my invoices that I have 14 day terms, but most companies, they have their own internal policies of what their terms are. The company I used to work for, they would demand 30 day terms or they would not do business with you. So typically I've never gotten a deposit for any job. Um, but I have, you can protect yourself through your contracts though. You could have something in there that if they cancel within a certain amount of time or no call, no show, something like that, you do get a fee paid to you for that. And it is legally binding. And most companies, they don't want any trouble. I've never had any issues with anybody canceling on me like that. We've always been able to resolve it and reschedule in, a, in an amicable way. But um, you typically get paid. I would plan on getting paid within 30 days of when you got the job. I did a job last Friday and I just got a check in the mail today, actually. So some places are really fast, some places are slow. So Ken or retainer, do I have people on retainer? No, I can't say anybody has me on retainer right now, but that would be a really interesting business model that I should look into. Um, David says, I'll tell photobomb. Yes, my I'll tell is in the back, photobomb. Okay. Kelly asks, have I had to chase any payments? And Lindsay asks, have you been stiffed on a fee? I've never been stiffed on a fee. And yes, I've had to chase payments before, especially surprisingly with larger companies. Oops. With larger companies, they have a whole entire accounting department. So you send your invoice in and it has to get routed to 10,000 people before it gets to accounting and a check gets cut and it gets mailed back to you. So yes, I've had to chase payments. The way I keep track of my payments and my invoices is through the WAVE app, W-A-V-E app. And you can actually set reminders. You can put a due date on the invoice and you can set reminders like, hey, seven days after this due date, 14 days after this due date, 21 days after this due date, it'll keep sending me reminders to go back and harass them about a payment. So um, and maybe harassment isn't the best word, but <laughs> it will remind you to go back and talk to them about a payment. So, and John says construction, yeah, get to use, get paid later. Yep, that's very standard. Everything in construction works as a PO. Very few people will just swipe a credit card for anything, even at like the hardware store, even at the grocery store, even at an office supply store, everything is used through POs and invoices in that world. Um, Jeff asked, how will RTK tie into accuracy? Is it capable of bringing accuracy to the point that GCPs are unnecessary? I know DJI claims centimeter accuracy with their RTK. You know, Jeff, I don't really know the answer because I haven't tried it. And I don't want to say, I've read the things that claim that too. So I don't want to say yes or no to that question. Personally, I don't think so. But, um, you know, I'll have to try it. I'll have to try it definitely once, I, once I'm saved up and up for my M. Matrice 210 RTK. Okay. John asks, have you tried QuickBooks versus Wave? I have tried QuickBooks and I didn't like it. And I love Wave. I love Wave also because it's free. <laughs> but I love Wave. Um, it's very easy for me to use. And um, yeah, I, I like Wave better. But QuickBooks is great too. QuickBooks has been an accounting staple for small businesses for many, many, many years. So I would say go with what you're used to, go with what you know. Um, and John also said that he can answer that question next week about the RTK because he's used it. <laughs> okay, next question from Ken. Do you have someone on site that signs each time to verify you were there or sign an invoice for that day? Great question, Ken. It depends on how your contract is worded. So 
if you have a time and material contract, somebody will probably sign off that you were there. So if you're getting paid on a timely basis, you should get somebody to sign off on either a timesheet that you make or an invoice. If you have a lump sum contract, it's irrelevant because they're just paying you for what you did. So basically they're paying you for your photos. So as soon as you deliver the photos, I what I do is in my email, where I send them the link, depending on how they're getting it, if I'm sending them a Dropbox link, let's say, I'll put the link in the email and I'll attach my invoice with the link so it's all in one email. Hey, I sent you your stuff, here's my invoice, this is what you paid for. it. Um, if they're paying me hourly, like a half day rate or a full day rate for something, I will have somebody sign off on the sheet. And that's standard practice in the construction world in general. If you have a T&M contract, a time and material contract, you would want somebody to sign your timesheets. Um, okay, the catalyst says, have you ever had to apply for a waiver for one of your jobs? Actually, I have not been okay in, in class golf airspace because most of my jobs are in the middle of nowhere or I'm working under a company that has a waiver. Um, but I know how to apply for a waiver. So I know that probably doesn't help you at all. The fact that I've, I've never done one, but I will tell you that is not something that a client will ever ask you about, at least as things are now. Okay. John says, thanks for the info. Hope you do more of these. I have to run into the grocery store before they close. Awesome. John, thank you for joining us. You can see the rest of the replay at Jornero.co slash QA, and I will post this at the end. Okay. Ken says the invoice may end up with an accountant in a small room and they question it. So a signature could help to show it's legit. Totally agree with you. A signature never hurts, but it is not required if it is a lump sum type of thing. And like I said, I always attach my link to my invoice. I mean, yeah, the link, I always attach my product to my invoice when I send it. Tyler asks, what amount of post work goes into your projects? Any recommendations for learning those skills? So for me, I do minimal post work. I am not a professional video editor. I use Final Cut Pro 10 and I do basic stuff. Um, and any recommendations for learning those skills? YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. There are so many tutorials on anything Photoshop, Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere, iMovie, any um, Camtasia is another popular video editing software. Um, and to edit photos, I actually use Fotor, F-O-T-O-R. It's a free, free program. And it does stuff like really quick. Like it'll add an Instagram filter to the photos really quick. And that's what I do just to touch up things if I'm overexposed or underexposed or things that are really quick. I don't consider myself a photographer, nor do I advertise myself as a photographer. And 99.99999% of the time, the people who I deal with in the construction company or in the construction world, they're not looking for Smithsonian level photography. So amount of post work is very minimal. I try and keep it as minimal as possible and even better if I don't have to edit anything. Jeff asks, what level of insurance do most jobs require? One million, five million more? It really depends on what they're asking in the bid. Um, I've seen some for 5 million. I've done some for 5 million when I get five, I have 5 million now. Um, 1 million is the standard. So I would start with 5 million and upgrade. I mean, start with 1 million and upgrade to 5 million if you need to. And your insurance person should be able to quickly upgrade you to that 5 million. If I'm, that's what my insurance person told me. I, I would ask Evan that question though, before I start giving insurance advice. <laughs> Okay, Kelly asks, do you usually deliver pics or videos via Dropbox? What are some other delivery methods you have used? So I do typically use Dropbox if it's something really quick. They just want the photos or the videos really quickly. Um, I've also used Google Drive. Some companies have FTP sites, which I think stands for File Transfer Processing. I know that's not what it stands for, but they'll, they'll actually provide a Dropbox in a sense of their own site and I'll put the photos on there and share it with them and send it over. Or something that I do personally because I know how to do it, I'll create a database for them and that's an upsell that I have within Sky Ninja. And so I'll create a site for them that they pay for and I'll pop the photos into that site and then give access to whoever they want to have access to it. But typically, most of the time I use Dropbox, yes, um, or Google Drive, depending on their personal preference, if they want their pictures on the cloud. If not, then we'll look at other alternatives like an FTP site if they have one internally or with um, a site that I build for them. 
Lindsay says, I do really like lynda.com for learning new software from a beginner stand- starting point, but it's not free. And I agree. When I was in college, they used to give us Lynda for free and it was great. But now that I'm not a student, I need, uh, yeah, I, I like free stuff. So like I said, YouTube, there's a lot of great resources out there. But if you want something a little more structured that takes you through step one, two, three, four, five, Lynda is a great resource. Do you do more mapping than just as opposed to just still shots? Um, I would say I do mostly still shots because it's cheaper for the customer and it's faster for me. But I make more money. I make more money when I do mapping, and mapping is an area that I concentrate on a lot when I'm trying to sell businesses, um, especially construction companies, on what I do in addition to inspections. So. Oh, Eric says it stands for file transfer protocol. FTP site stands for file transfer protocol, y'all. Not whatever I said. <laughs> okay. So Catalyst asks, have you ever had to obtain any state certification for surveying, for example? Uh, the, the answer to that is no, because I do not claim to be a surveyor. And it's all about how you word your services. A lot of times if I if they want a survey, Survey, I'll team up with this that has those capabilities or I'll work under a surveying firm, but I never claim to be a surveyor. Um, as far as licenses or certificates, I mean, every place is different. Like I said, with the ocean, get it, especially if you're new to construction and other places might have different certificates. And yes, I had to get my OSHA 30, um, which is a higher level of OSHA. Oh, gosh. Oh. This isn't good. Am I frozen? It's really laggy. Okay, I think I'm back. Okay. Okay. So, that we had submitted before the broadcast. How can I get a construction company to see the value in my solutions? It's all about showing it to them. Show them and give them hard numbers. Project managers, people in those roles, they deal with a lot of numbers and data. They love numbers. I can save you. I have saved X company 20% on their costs by doing Y. They love numbers like that. So go online do some research, and then go out and get some results. Because you don't want to go out there claiming numbers that aren't true. You don't want to tell somebody, I can save you 25% and you come back and you only save them 3% and your services don't pay for themselves. So hard numbers, hard metrics. Okay. Um, what is the minimum software camera aircraft needed? So it depends on what the services you're going to offer, but really... I got started with a Phantom 3 Professional or that Autel that you guys see in the back. I made money with that. I made maps with that. I took pictures. I took videos with that. That's what I started with. Um, and now I have an Inspire as well. But that's what you need. I also have, I brought some show and tell. Um, also, if you're going to go into the construction industry, you're going to need what is in here. And we'll start with a hard hat. Just, ooh. A regular hard hat is fine. This one is what is known as, here, I'll just put it on my head. This one is what is known as uh, safari style. So it has the brim all the way around, but you can get any style you want. You can get the ones where the brims are just in the front. Um, and then we have a high, visi- a high visibility safety vest. This is a regular safety vest, and it has the little marks on it, um, the reflectors on it. So you need a safety vest. And then you also need safety glasses, if I can find them. I think I lost them. I lost them. They were right here. Anyway, when you get, this is very, very important. When you get safety glasses, they need to say Z87 on them. If they are not Z87, they are not real safety glasses. They're garbage. They belong in the garbage because if you wear just sunglasses or prescription glasses or regular glasses out on the job site and they are not rated for Z87, a rock is going to come up and not all, and it's going to shatter your glasses and you're going to have plastic and glasses and rock and dirt and worms in your eye. And nobody wants worms in their eye. 
I really wish I could show you all the C87 thing. Let me see if I can find them real quick. All right, I give up. I swear I had them right here. But anyway, make sure your safety glasses are Z87. And then John says, I do a lot of I do a lot pro bono just to gain experience on equipment, software, and deliverables. I agree. I do pro bono work as well. Um, and you always want to know with confidence that you can do something that you're claiming to do before you actually do it. Um, Lindsay asks, full brim versus visor brim. Um, to me, a visor is something that has the open top. It needs to be a close top, but full rim versus like all the way around safari style, like what I have versus the front, it doesn't matter from a safety standpoint. I personally think safari style looks better on my head because I have a weird shaped head, y'all. And so I look weirder in a safety in a, in a hard hat in general. So I think the full brim just looks better on me, but it doesn't matter. Um, I heard that some people like the full brim because it keeps their neck cooler. So there could be something there. I'm not sure, but I like the full brims personally. And then John says, oh gosh, he says, damn, can't wear my sunglasses, you know, rock star and all. That's right, John, you can't wear sunglasses. Although they do make sunglass style safety glasses. Just make sure they say Z87 on the side, on the little leg, you know, the part that goes on your ear. Make sure it says Z87. Okay, awesome. So... I didn't, I realized I didn't finish answering this question. What is the minimum software camera aircraft needed? Like I said, all telex are premium camera uh, that has a 4k camera, 12 megapixels. Um, but really the minimum is a 1080p camera. You need a three axis gimbal. Otherwise your, your videos are not going to be good. Um, and as far as software, get what you can afford. If you can't afford to get drone deploy or pix 4d or any of those mapping softwares, then don't do mapping. Just concentrate on the videos, concentrate on the photos. There's a market for that. Um, but if you can afford more, get the better software. Just know that getting a software like Pix4D and some of the other things that are out there, you're going to need a more powerful computer. So I, I kind of brag about my 2010 MacBook Pro that I use. And I use a version of Pix4D that's no longer supported because it's a Mac. But I also have a Windows parallel desktop and I have a five terabyte hard drive that plugs into it that helps me roam, helps where the Windows is kept anyway. But I upgraded my MacBook Pro to a 16 gigabyte hard drive and to a 500 gigabyte solid state drive. So I have upgraded my MacBook Pro in order to be useful with Pix4D and other things. But just know, get a fast laptop, at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. And you can always upgrade, especially if you get a Mac. Um, and make sure you have plenty of storage space. Like I said, I have the five terabyte hard drive. I have a lot of terabytes on Dropbox. I have SD cards everywhere out that my ears, 64 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes out of my ears. Um, I have various other hard drives that plug in. So you need a lot of storage space. And I know that's not the most efficient and the best way to store your stuff, but you know, I'm kind of getting it together right now with that. Um, Next question, what would you consider overkill for aircraft camera? I would consider overkill of things that you can't afford and things that are not cost effective for your business. So if you're only doing pictures and videos, you don't need a Matrice 210. <laughs> I would love to have a Matrice 210 in Sky Ninja, but it just doesn't make sense for us right now. The only reason we would get it is if we started losing a significant amount of money due to weather issues and we're not we don't have that issue. We're always able to reschedule and it doesn't impact our business a whole lot. I think if I lived in a place where weather was a bigger issue or we got a lot more business, we had multiple people out all over the country or something, a Matrice 210 would definitely be helpful. But get, get an aircraft that's most cost effective for your business and what you're trying to do. Okay. Ryan says contacts aren't a good idea in dusty construction environments either. Yeah, that's probably true. I wear contacts. So fun fact about me, y'all, I've been wearing glasses since I was nine months old. And so I, I wore glasses for 17 years until I got contacts. And so I'm pretty much over glasses. Also, another note, um, you can get prescription safety glasses. So if you do wear glasses and you don't want to wear contacts and you want to follow Ryan's advice, which is great advice, 
um, they do make prescription safety glasses. So, and Ken asks, where are you? New York, New Jersey. I'm actually in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So near New Jersey, kind of close to New York, but I'm in Philadelphia. Okay. So before I sign off, give my closing notes. Are there any more questions? Post it in the comments below or forever hold your peace. I hope this Q&A Monday has again been very informative. And I hope that you all tune in next week when we have John McBride talking about thermography. I know it's very anticipated, a big one that's coming up next week. Um, and also, if you want to watch the replay of this, you missed it, you want to watch it again, go ahead and go to www dronero.co slash QA. You can see last week's Q&A with Evan Garman about UAS insurance. Tonight's Q&A will be going up there tonight and future Q&As will be stored there in perpetuity. So love that you guys are loving it. Ken said this was great. Kelly says this was awesome. David said thanks so much, Taylor. The Catalyst says thank you. Lindsay says super awesome. Thank you. 